of all the places to be today, I am so excited to be sitting here with the former Ohio Senator uh, Nina Turner. Wow, what a privilege it is. How are you? I'm fine, Kofi. The pleasure <laughs> is all mine to be sitting with you. You are a prodigy. <laughs> I'm reading all you. the stuff you've accomplished more in, in a few years than most people do in a lifetime. <laughs> you still got many more years to go. How I, are you feeling today? I'm doing well. I appreciate it. I mean, I have a great person to look up to. Oh, uh, <laughs> thank you. I'm sure many more before me. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. So kind. Thank you. Um, I, I want to get straight into it, honestly. Okay. Um, I I see your journey and I've seen the, the uphill battle that it's been. I think one of the coolest things about seeing your journey has been the similarities that's been uh, within mine, and I'm sure many people can attest to that, but seeing that you kind of started off your first job at the age of 14, growing up in Cleveland, yeah. uh, and now we look now to this point and you're running for Congress. How do we get to this point? What's the journey getting here? The rough side of the mountain. There's a gospel <laughs> song that talks about the rough side of the mountain, but I'm doing my best to make, mm. it, to make it in, or I often like to talk about Langston Hughes is one of his many poems. I absolutely love Langston Hughes, but the one mother to son, life mm. ain't been no crystal stair. Mm. And I think that is the most succinct description of, of my life, that it has not been a crystal stair, but I, I keep climbing. That was the mother's message to the son. And I would say message to sons and daughters mm -hmm. that you know life is going to be hard, but as long as you continue to persevere I believe that God, you know, you and I are both spiritual. I believe that God will always send you guides mm -hmm. along the way to, to help you. So mm -hmm. I am where I am today because of grandma and mama and grandpa, who I don't necessarily talk about enough. My brother mm -hmm. always fusses at me. Saying, you leaving out <laughs> grandpa. And, you know, even my dad, I mean, you know my life story. My mother died really young at 42 and I miss her every single day. My dad is still here. He just turned 74 wow. and uh, he has been such a good person you know, force in my life too. It's just in my younger years when I was growing up, my parents got divorced young and my mom was a custodial parent. Mm. You know what that feels like too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I look at your journey um, as it's kind of transpired and kind of switched from, you know, starting off maybe early in activism. Now it's you know, deeply in politics. Yeah. Um, is there a sense of, of responsibility or even pressure for somebody like yourself in this position to kind of, um, uplift and you know really be that example for the community that really looks up to you both responsibility Ooh. and pressure and i love that you put those two things together it's because of my upbringing because of my grandmother and also because of the black church you know my mother was a preacher mm -hmm. that has instilled in me some very important values now every individual doesn't always live up to those values even right. me i'm not perfect we have institutions that don't live up to them even in the in the church itself or in faith mm. Many of the wars that are being fought right now and today in the world is linked to somebody's faith. But the tenets of the three major religions in particular, doing others as you would have them doing to you. It may read differently in the Torah or read differently in the Quran, but it is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that has pretty much been my guiding force. Mm. And I do believe that there is a spiritual connection among human beings. Do you kind of feel that sometimes? I do, absolutely, too? especially when you're here. I mean, yeah. you, you automatically have just captured the attention of, <laughs> of everybody, I feel like. Um, <laughs> and, and it's beautiful to see. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that's so um, admirable about you is the dignity and the class that you hold in a, a bevy of different situations, whether it be an obstacle or something that, that's in your way. I mean, one moment that I hearken to is when you were on that CNN panel and there was a woman that, that made... Um, a suggestion that the hardships of black and brown people in America haven't been as bad as she wanted to make it seem like. And you had to quickly remind her that that wasn't the case. Oh, yeah, quickly. <laughs> With a sense of responsibility. And the way, the way that yeah. you handled that, though, was so cool to me and so respectful. I mean, my question to you is, because I know I wouldn't have done that. How did you find the, the composure in that moment? And even in moments like that in your political career to be, you know, as Michelle Obama said, when they go low, we go high. Well, some people might not say I do that all the time because oh, okay. um, I can be, I can go there. But you I, stay I, being yourself, though. Make, right. I make no apology because I do believe in it. If I had any message to young people and young adjacent people, you do have to be uniquely who you are. Mm. Now, yeah, respect is, is important. Decorum is important in most situations. But there comes a time where you just got to let folks know. Mm. 
And there needs to be a fierceness to that and to do it in an unapologetic way. But to answer your question directly, Kofi, I was calling on black Jesus. You hear me? <laughs> Not just any Jesus. Had to be black. Because in my head, I was cussing her out Ooh, strictly. And I know you can. Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, I, Because, you know, just the cavalier attitude. I mean, the point that we're talking about is the suffering of black and brown people. And I want to throw our indigenous sisters and brothers in there. There's a caste and class. Mm. So all working class people, no matter if they're white or black or Hispanic or Asian or indigenous or mm -hmm. in between all of that, there's a suffering. And then there's a unique suffering that our people bear. Right. And to have this colleague of mine, because I was a commentator on uh, CNN at the time, just kind of take a cavalier attitude and pretend like racism is dead. I wish it was dead. I wish I, well, I do. Let's live in that world. Let's right. help create that world. But for now, it is not. And you cannot have revisionist history. You might not like the history. It might be painful to face in the 21st century. But here's the history, like in 30 seconds. Mm. This country, before it was founded, stole the land of Native Americans. Pretend like they weren't here. That's truth. Right? I mean, yeah. I, I, check. They yep. did that. Then they enslaved our ancestors. Check. They treated women like extension of children, meaning white women, because black women, they had no power at all. Check. Created a, an economic system that crushed for generations, even to this very moment, the hopes and dreams of black people. Never got the 40 acres in the mule. Check, check. White supremacy, anti-blackness is real. And to me, that is where all the other isms percolate from. Mm -hmm. Now those are realities. We can we even gotta go way back. We can come on up to now. Black people lost 50% of their wealth during the Great Recession of 2008. Mm -hmm. Redlining, all of that kind of stuff. Right now in the pandemic, 41% of black businesses have gone out of business. So I'm using our people as an example. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Now you might not like the history as I just laid it out, but this is not whether or not you like it or not. It is true. Now, here's the beautiful thing, though, Kofi. Here's the promise mm -hmm. and the problem. We can have a different future than the past. Ooh, let's talk about let's it. Talk let's talk about, about that. it. Let's talk about it. Let's go into it. Yeah, because let's do that. I, I want to get into education real quick. Okay. And that's something that's near and dear to my heart, being Mine's a college too. student. Yeah. I and mean, you being a former. First generation. And, and a professor at your own mater. Listen, I did my homework. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I, I want to... Um, I want to talk about that because one of the conversations that a lot of my peers have right now is uh, the, the student loan debt and all yes. that stuff that comes into it. Um, what do you look at as the future for public education for college students? What is that for you? I would like to see, and the platform that I am running on is free colleges and universities, particularly public colleges and mm. universities. And I also believe that there should be a special um, carve out, if you will, for black colleges and universities whether they're public or private, mm. just because what those institutions represent historically and why they were created and the level to which they turn out black excellence. Yeah. They do. But free college and university as an investment. So people, well, nothing's free. You know what? You're right. I'm glad you said that. You're right. <laughs> nothing is free. It's an investment. It's our social contract. And so just as a community and a society, we pay for K through 12. Absolutely. If you go into a public right. schools, mm -hmm. Nobody asks you, your parents, to pay for it right then and there. We, we pay for it collectively. I want to see us extend that to pre-K to college mm. and universities and also vocational and tech ed. I feel like you've already answered it, but to somebody that would challenge you, or not even challenge, but question whether or not that is the way to do it. Maybe they're hesitant. They think, oh, that's a radical move to make. What say you to them? It's not radical. In the same way, once upon a time in this country, only wealthy white men were educated. And then it expanded out to, you know, poor white men, you know, white men in general, then women. And it's the same thing. We need to bring it up to the 21st century. That's what I say. We are making an investment, a collective investment from the K-12 model, a paradigm shift to pre-K to colleges and universities. It is an investment that is going to pay dividends. And I want to add, I'd like to talk a lot about, a little bit about voc ed and tech, mm -hmm. because as somebody who taught college, you know, I always go to college, go to college, right. but the reality is, Kofi, not everybody's going to go to college, and that's okay, too, as long as they have the ability to get some skill set that will help them to be competitive 
in the 21st century, but it can happen. You know, President Nelson Mandela once said, it always seems impossible until it was done, mm -hmm. until it is done. There was once upon a time in this country that nobody even dreamed that they were going to expand education as we know it today to the masses. Mm. We need to reimagine what education looks like in the 21st century. I love that, century. reimagining the, yeah. the idea of how this should be done. That's right. That's beautiful. Dr. Eddie Glaw mm. talks about that all the time. I love we it. Reimagine. So I got to give him <laughs> credit for it. I love to hear him say, we need to reimagine. <laughs> yeah, let's reimagine some stuff. Let's do it. Whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> A whole bunch of yes. stuff. Yes. And I want to see cancel student debt. Now talk to me about the pressures of student debt and what do you hear from your peers? Oh my goodness. And I think for me, uh, being in a school, like I go to Berkeley College of Music right now, um, being a private institution, it's a little different. Yes. Um, but one of the hardships that I see is, if I were to be honest with you, I mean, it's the fact that Berkeley College of Music is a school that is built on showcasing and explaining and teaching music of the black African-American diaspora. Yeah. Yet, so many African-American students aren't able to get scholarships. They're not getting those opportunities that a lot of my Caucasian friends are getting or white friends are getting. Sure. And now we're in a situation where, okay, not everybody had the opportunity like, like myself to have that first year funded because their community helped to, you know, donate and everything gratefully. But there's so many students that are sitting in $70,000 in debt for one, one year. Yeah. And uh, it's hard. And I think it's, it's difficult, especially for, for someone that's trying to do music, um, a career that's already unstable from a standpoint of, there's no job security um, right off the rip. Sure. You know, most most professions you think of, maybe if it's a medical field or even anything else, you can automatically kind of find that way in. There's there's jobs. There's there's always going to be hospitals. There's always going to be nurses, and you need that. That's right. But that avenue for musicians and artists and creatives, it's a little more difficult. So I think that high tuition price can can it can also, it can stop dreams from being done, you know? And I think that's disheartening too. There's so many people that I've met that I believe should have went to Berkeley or should have gone to Juilliard or these Come music on. schools, but because of their situation, because of the, the limitations that they had off the rip, not even because of any type of talent, just because they didn't have the, the resources. Sure. That frustrates me. That yeah. frustrates me. I'm with you. So While I'm on the Langston Hughes, <laughs> Another poem. What, what happens, happens to a to dream deferred? You better talk about. I it. mean, that's, that, that's something about. that that and it yeah. really does echo with me because it's it's a thought process of man. There, there's really there's not that. That's what makes my job and my responsibility as a leader to my peers so much more important because not everybody has this opportunity. Yeah. And I realize that, and I realize this platform. I tell people all the time that it's really it's bigger than music. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than. I'm not playing a piano right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking. I'm talking to you. You know. Yeah. And so I wish I, you were, though. Playing. I know. I, I should have had should one have some set up. Spice up in here. <laughs> yeah. But I'm so I'm so grateful for that platform, and I'm yeah. grateful for um, everything that it offers. And I know that I'm not done, but I know no. that people are being inspired. My peers are being uplifted, and if I can continue to do that, and and seeing that you're continuing to push for this free public ex education, um, I think we're going to be in the right place moving forward. I think so too, and, and I want people to see it as an investment. Because you asked me earlier, what yeah. what would I say? somebody just see it as an investment mm. we have to invest in each other human capital is the best capital that we have but it must be invested we must invest in that, that human capital mm. and not allow any group of people to languish why should opportunities only be available to people who have the most wealth mm. no that's not what it's about it should be opportunities for all and sometimes along the way when we think about opportunity equity has to be in there Meaning somebody else may need a little more than I need just to come up to even where I am. Yeah. And that is okay to admit that and let's be, have a willingness to, to do it. Equality Absolutely. and equity and justice, those three things go together. That equity and justice is really capturing me and at least kind of to my next like question for you. I, I think generally across America right now, um, we have seen a great deal or a, you know, a heightening level of civil unrest. Yes. And I think it's just been a conversation that's been at the forefront of so many dinner tables. So many American people have been talking about how we feel right now. And at the time of filming this right now, we're just a couple days past that one year mark of the murder of George Floyd. Yes. And um, George Floyd's death, I believe, was a, a huge major catalyst for, for social reform, social change. It brought the world together uh, and brought a conversation about what the worth and the value of black life is right now in America. 
America. Sure. What I want to ask you, though, is I want to look back a year. I want to go back to May 25th, 2020 for you. And I want to know what was going through your mind as this news was unfolding? What was what was going through Nina Turner's mind? Yeah, definitely a heaviness. Also, the feeling of we've been here before. Mm. It was George Floyd then, you know, d different stage, but the same, the same, same stuff. The same stuff happening. I thought about Sandra Bland. I, I listen. You know, I thought about Tamir <laughs> yeah. Rice. Yeah. I thought about uh, Diallo. Mm. You know, um, Rodney King. Wow. I mean, and even beyond that our ancestors who wow. had to endure some of the same trauma on a more consistent basis than even what we're dealing with today, which we should not be dealing with that. I want to be very clear. And then as I continue to study Cho uh, Chauvin and just the look in his eyes of indifference, he just didn't, he didn't give a damn. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no other way to describe that, that you can put your knee. First, we thought it was eight minutes and 46 seconds. And then through the trial, we find out it was about nine minutes and 20 one seconds of even people around you pleading with you, pleading for George Floyd's life. So it was like a quickening. It was a swirl of emotions. I mean, I want to know how you felt too, but that's a, a swirl of emotion. And I likened it to, you know, I, I taught black history at Cuyahoga Community College. And when we would talk about lynching that started to occur, you know, during the reconstruction period, uh, you know, once black people were free, that's when mm -hmm. lynchings started to happen. Think wow. about that because wow. our ancestors were chattel slavers, chattel slaves. For the most part, you don't want to destroy your property for the most part or kill your property. But the whole lynching in America. And I thought about Ida B. Wells, Barnett, mm. the journalist, the businesswoman who had the courage to challenge this country and call out the, the lynchings of black people. And the reasons why uh, white folks said they were lynching us was primarily because they said black men were uh, raping uh, white women. And when she delved into it deeper, it was a jealousy. It was the same thing because as we look at what's the one-year anniversary of George Floyd, we're also in the midst of 100 years since the Black Tulsa Massacre. Mm. Black Wall Street in Tulsa, in the Tulsa area, Greenwood. But let me go back to you. Asked, so just looking in that man's eyes and kind of studying what was going on around here, it made me think about the pictures I used to show in my Black History class of white people at lynchings. But they would come out as a community, white women, white, they brought their kids, white men, and they posing in front of these pictures. They would send them out as postcards. Some of them would take body parts uh, from lynched people and, as souvenirs. That, the, the, the photograph, I locked in Chauvin and what was in his eyes as he had his knees mm. on George Floyd's neck. And it reminded me of those photographs of a white community coming out, posing around a black body that was swinging from a tree wow. or being burned at the state. How was it for you? For me, um, you know, it, it brought back similar feelings, but it brought out what I hope never would have happened for me. And that was a fear. Yeah. Um, a fear as a, as a black man. And, um, you know, I think we talk about racial discord among so many different communities. You could look at the Asian community, the LGBTQ sure. plus community. Yes, transgender. Um, yeah, oh, absolutely. But if we're going to be real, disproportionately, African-Americans have received a great brunt of that racial oh, brutality. Yeah. It and started I, with anti-blackness. Ab absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think that as a black man, you know, it, it hits home for me because I remember being in high school and. There was a time in Northeast Ohio where there was a number of different um, you know, shootings that were happening within the week. I think within the whole week, we had like maybe 10 to 15, you know, uh, casualties from a gun. Sure. And, and so uh, a lot of my peers at the time were afraid to go out into the world. And so I took that, that portion of uh, leadership to say, OK, I want to create some type of change. And um, I started this wristband campaign and the wristband said, humble and have no fear. And I would pass yeah. them out at school. And. You know, I went on the news and was talking about it because I wanted people to know that, you know, be humble. Remember where you've come from mm -hmm. throughout everything that's going on. But have no fear. Have no fear to be who you want to be. Yes. Achieve those goals that you want to achieve. But in this moment, after seeing that video, after seeing uh, this man crying, pleading for his life, for his mother. For his mama. Yeah. Ooh, it, it hit me to a point to where I had to ask myself, I said, when, when will this ever be okay? For me, when when will right. 
when will normal ever be normal for black people? You know, when will I be able to walk down the street and not worry about oh, whether or not I have this blazer on, will people perceive me to be one way or not? Because I've, I've, I've tested that. Uh-huh. I've gone to communities, and I've, I've, I live right now in, in Boston right now, and I go out in Boston, sometimes I wear a blazer. I don't see, I'll see, I'm like, let me see how they perceive me. Uh huh. Then I'll go out to that same spot and I'll wear a hoodie. And I'll see how they look at me that way. And they get, they get scared. They ask, what are you doing here? They'll card me for my ID at places I've never been before. No. It's, and so you get a different perception on who you are as a black person because of just your appearance. Right. And, and to see that this has been, this is, this is a way that, that life is. And I talk to so many of my, my friends and my, my brothers about this, about how do we, how do we navigate this? How do we find a way to, to show humanity within us if they already are judging us by the time we walk into the room? Sure. Two things come to mind just listening to you, and I'm glad that you tested that out in real time. And there is no other group that has that kind of burden. And I'm not saying that people are not judged by their attire, but our entire existence is judged. Mm. I mean, think about that. From the time we are born, we are critiqued, our nose, our lips. You're a black woman, your hips, your behind, your hair, not good enough, you gotta straighten it. The psychological damage, see Dr. W.B. Du Bois talked about that in the souls of black folks in a different way, but he said we were two souls warring in one black body. One is the African ancestry, you know, our ancestors and the motherland and all of the countries of that motherland, a continent. Right. Some folks need to understand it's a continent. <laughs> and then, though, but it's the American side of us, too. And we're not quite accepted in either place because we were artificially brought here. But this is our home. And so the fact that we always have to constantly prove our worth. See, we're not born worthy. Right. We got to prove our worth. And so if your degrees are not good enough, oh, Dr. Henry Louis Gates. Mm-hmm. Remember what happened to him at his own house. Wow. He got arrested on his porch. So that ain't good enough. We dress up, that ain't good enough. We straighten our hair, that ain't good enough. We talk prim and proper, that ain't good enough. We learn proper etiquette, that ain't good enough. When is it going to be good enough in the land of our birth? As a matter of fact, the country that our ancestors built. So you are right, I mean, Kofi, your, your, your deepness, you know, still waters run deep. As a community and as a nation, this conundrum must be solved. And the burden is not just on black people to solve it because we didn't create the conundrum. Exactly. White America did. I was going to ask you, like, so what, what can we do as a collective whole or just to empower our own selves as black people? How can we instill that hope within ourselves, even though we've been in these situations? What can we do to start that change and start that new future well, for Well, you're us? doing it. You're doing it. <laughs> I'm doing it, but You're how, doing how can it. other people other do it? Other folks are going, they, everybody got to do their part. You're right. You're right. And if we're all doing our part, you know, I don't know. I've been on this puzzle tip for a long time. <laughs> Not that I love puzzles. I hate puzzles. Actually. <laughs> but, you know, think about the thousand piece puzzle. Yeah. And somebody dumps it on the table and they're, they're mixing. They're trying to find where to start and mm-hmm. where to write. All of the pieces have to fit for the picture to become clear. Gotcha. So my message would be to young folks and young adjacent folks. We are like that thousand piece puzzle. None of us are quite the same. But when you put that entire puzzle together, the picture becomes clearer. Love it. And it's a beautiful thing. That is it. Everybody has to do what they can, where they are, or what they have. Their role may be different from your role or my role, but everybody has a role. Right. And nobody can abdicate their responsibility to fight for justice in all of its forms. So I would say read. I mean, there's something certain about getting the academic side. There's mm-hmm. another part about getting it from the street side and all you're getting, get understanding and then figure out what God has called you to do. You know, one of my, the quotes you said to me that you remembered, which touched my heart <laughs> as such a young man. And, and you said, you remember when I said titles are good, but purpose is better. So it's not enough to have a whole bunch of highfalutin people with fancy titles. What's your purpose? Right. And are you using that purpose for, to construct or for destructive purposes? Mm-hmm. That becomes the question. But from a global sense, this country needs truth and reconciliation. They need to admit that what they have done to African-American community is generational, and it needs a generational fix. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. I do support reparations to American descendants of really? slaves. I absolutely do. Uh, money, there has to be a debt. 
there has to be repentance, repentance, and then you got to pay. And if we're ever going to stop uh, or close the gap on racial inequality in terms of the wealth gap, there has to be a governmental response to that. And so I do encourage people who are, want to find out more about that, Dr. Sandy Darity and uh, his, his, um, his colleague and wife, Ms. Mullins, they have an excellent book out that really talks about reparations and what forms it should take in the United States of America for American descendants of slaves. And then also Dr. Derek Hamilton, who is a stratification mm. economist. He was at the current institute at The Ohio State University. And now he's back at the new school in New York. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, it's just, we, we got to do that. And, and doing that for black people doesn't take anything away from other people. I like to talk about caste and class. There are a whole group of poor people in this country, 140 million of them that come from all walks of life. Mm. They're white, they're Hispanic, they're indigenous, they're Asian, they're black, you name it. All got all. So I do believe also in what Dr. King was working on before he was assassinated, which was the Poor People's Campaign, All People. Uh, Dr. Dr. William Barber has expanded that to the 21st century. But also what Reverend, Do uh, Reverend, Reverend Jesse Jackson was doing in the 80s, the Rainbow Coalition. Yeah. That's it. Wow. Yeah. And you guys going to put some 21st century on that we, stuff. We got to do something to it. Yeah. <laughs> it's time. It is time. I look at um, your journey. I see the journey from even starting off with the Cleveland City Council, and I'm, I'm going to miss some stuff because you've done so oh, much. Oh, okay. So you get Cleveland City Council, then you go uh, Ohio State Senate, then it's you're running the campaign trails with Bernie Sanders, and then you're running a podcast on iHeartRadio. Hello, hello, somebody. The Black Effect Network. <laughs> hello, somebody. And now you're in a position where you're running for Congress. Um, the what is this Ohio 11 special election talk to a lot of my peers that may not even understand because I think that we do look every four years and I'm not going to lie to you and say that I'm not one of the people that once did I mean yeah. I, I used to think okay it's only about the president and then you'll keep, you'll catch me in four years I think yeah. but um but this is so important it is talk to me about it I'm glad that you would you know confession is good for the soul <laughs> there's an election every year yeah there is so that's what I want even, it's not even just your peers. There are a whole bunch of grown, grown folks that don't know. There's something on the ballot every year. Your school board, your judges, the prosecutor, every year an issue on the ballot. So I want people, every year there's an election, and we have to be in it to win it. You can't sit on the sidelines and complain. At least you got to vote or run or do something, help somebody that's running. But for Ohio 11 special, a congresswoman, former congresswoman, Marsha Fudge is now Secretary Hud, wow. so she's Secretary Fudge, and that opened up the special election that we are in right now. So it's a totally open seat, and I am competing in, uh, for the seat. Uh, Twelve other people are competing as okay. well, but I am running, and the 11th Congressional District geographically spans portions of greater Cleveland and also portions of greater Akron, and we're in Akron right yes, we now. Are. We're in your home <laughs> turf right now. I'm here today campaigning in Akron, awesome. very much a part of Northeast Ohio. And so the, ele the election day for the primary is August the 3rd. Okay. But early voting starts on July the 7th. And so I want to encourage everybody to get engaged in this race. Look at the candidates. I hope that you find that I am the one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be honest, but look at the candidates. <laughs> I hope you find that I am the one. I want your vote. And to at, request an absentee ballot application, fill that out, send it in, get your absentee ballot, and, and fill that out and vote starting on July the 7th. But that's why we have a, a special election. It's special because there's a vacancy. Got you. Got you. I, I want you to understand. I'm uh, Listen, I'm going to look at that ballot really closely. But I think, I think I know. I think I know who I'm going to go for. Well, we got two votes at this <laughs> we table got right two. now. We, we got, just got to work a little harder. Work a little harder. I want to talk to my, uh, talk to my, my peers of that do want to, you know, vote for you or whoever yeah. they choose to vote for. Um, and maybe they aren't in Ohio full time. Maybe they're in school in other states or whatever. But Ohio and Akron and wherever they're at, this district is still home. That's the right. right. Um, and they can request that absentee ballot application. How can we ensure, though, that when we do vote for you on that ballot, that you will take us with you to Congress? Oh, I'm taking you. You can be assured <laughs> of that by my work. I see it. By my work. I will take I, all the hopes and the dreams and also the fears and the challenges and the pain of this district is coming with me. I'm a daughter of this district. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. I still live there. I've lived there the overwhelming majority of my life. My relationships with Northeast Ohio is intact. 
and my lived experience. That's how you, I, I've been poor, the working poor, the barely middle class, but by the grace of God, there go I. And just looking at the work, my body of work here to four wow. is very much evident that I will not forget where I came from. And I'm going there to fight for the poor, the working poor, and the barely middle class. The mm. least of these, our sisters and brothers. Mm. Taking you with me. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm fighting for you now at this point. I'm, Thank I'm, you. You've inspired me. I think um, what you're doing is amazing. I say it so much. Um, I'm so grateful that you spent some time with me today, that we were able to talk a little bit more about everything. I mean, this is, this is so incredible, such a blessing. And um, how can people stay up to date, get updated, and, and even be involved with everything that you're doing? Thank you for that. They can go to ninaturner.com. That's okay. ninaturner.com. And there's a way to get involved. They can volunteer. You don't even have to be in Ohio to volunteer. You can call in. So we have a text bank. We have a phone bank that people can do from the comfort of their homes wow. or their dorms, wherever they mm -hmm. are. They can do that. They can give money for the mission. The average donation to this campaign is $27, Kofi. It is truly a grassroots funded wow. election because I want to make sure, you know, very much in what Senator Sanders was able to show us when he first ran in 2016, that that the, it, the special interests, you know, my, my dear friend, Killer Mike, Michael Render would say, you know, the only special interest should be the people. So I want people to know they're my most important special interest, that when mm -hmm. I go to that Congress, the only special interest I will have to answer to is that of the people. And so for every $3, $5, $27, and even people who can max out to me, because that's okay, too. We want some wealthy folks hey, on listen, our side. Listen. And we want them to know. We want them to kick it with us <laughs> for sure. and know that the system is rigged and we need to do something about <laughs> it. But for every dime that somebody gives, they are pouring into this campaign in a way that allows my team and, and I to be able to run this people-powered race to only answer to the special interests of the people. So ninaturner.com on social media, I'm at Nina Turner on Twitter, Nina Turner at Ohio, Nina Turner Ohio on Instagram, mm -hmm. and Nina Turner on Facebook. Ooh, let's do it. We got work to do, but I'm, do. I'm excited we for gonna it. We're going to do this. Thank you so much. Great things. Thank you. Now, next time we get together, let's tell stories with through music. Hey, listen, I got to get a piano. I'm, I'm going to be on yes. that. <laughs> I got yes. it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I Thank appreciate you, it. I appreciate you. <laughs>